So if anyone calls 911, Red Cross is going to be there free of charge, totally free of charge. So we always use the example that we can have the best ambulance, we can have the best equipment, we can have the best uh, RCP equipment, but if we don't have people, we don't have nothing. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Gintare and I work uh, at the IFRC Solferino Academy. I'm very happy to be here today and to interview a fantastic leader. We have with us here today Ms. Diana Marenko Gonzalez, the president of the Costa Rican Red Cross. Diane, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gintar. Thank you, IFRC. And thank you, Solferino Academy, for inviting me and inviting our National Society to be part of this process. Thank you. It's, it's always wonderful to talk to great people. So thank you for being here. Uh, let me ask uh, my first question so the viewers would know you a little bit better. Uh, tell us a little bit about your personal journey. What inspired you to become a humanitarian? Okay, well, I started start being volunteer when I was 15 years old. I was in high school and um, one day I just came back home and uh, the TV was already on and I sit in, in the... Um, in the table and I start seeing all the news about emergencies in Costa Rica. There were in that time many floods and um, I asked myself what I'm doing here, why I'm not there <laughs> and then I go, I went into my grandma's and I tell my grandma, um, grandma I would like to be a volunteer and she told me ah okay I have been volunteer since 20 years. And I told her, okay, how can I do it? And she told me, wait, I can call a friend, which is Volunteer Red Cross, and he can support us. So that's how we start. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to help. I just wanted to, to do something else. And my grandma helped me. And even I didn't know, my grandma inspired me to become a volunteer. That's a nice story. Thank you. Thank you, Grandma, for bringing <laughs> Diane to, to the IFRC yeah. network. Okay, but not every volunteer becomes a president. So what also kind of uh, uh, inspired you or, or what gave you motivation to seek this higher position of leadership? Wow, I have to be honest. And the first thing I would like to say is that I have never, ever dreamed to become the president of a national society. Never. It was not in my plans. I, I had... A lot of humanitarian plans in, in the movement, like driving ambulances, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, become a search, I mean, like to travel out to other countries to support in emergencies. Those were my dreams and it's still in my bucket dreams. But being the president, well, as I said, it was never in my plan. But I arrived to some point where the National Society need help and need someone to be brave and be there. And that's it. I say yes. Mm -hmm. And after that, all the process became. Started. Okay. So now as you, uh, you are as a leader in, in this uh, qu quite high position, uh, where do you get your inspiration? Uh, or maybe I will say it more concretely. With which, with, with which leader in the world you would like to have a, a cup of coffee and have a conversation and ask for some advice or, or recommendation? Who would be that leader? Wow, that's a beautiful question. To be honest, many leaders. To be honest, uh, there are many women and men that inspire humanitarian work. I would like to ask some questions to Henry Dunant, <laughs> just to give you an example. Because for us, that we study our, our history, for him it was not easy. I mean, when he has his idea, his idea, he has to push and push and push and push and make diplomatic issues to make it possible. So I would like to, to go back a little bit uh, in, in the time and ask him many questions. And I would like to remark that when he was in Solferino at the battle, he was 30 years. Mm -hmm. So he was young. As, as I am, and I feel inspired to, to see how he just stopped and start uh, working and he changed the world with, with his inspiration. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course, there are many, but I have to tell you that there is one person where I always go back <clears throat> and talk when I, have, uh, when I need inspiration, and it's my mom. 
my mom, uh, since all her life, she has been a uh, part of the humanitarian sector, not Red Cross. She always supports indigenous population, people with disability, elderly people, young people. And um, she really inspires, inspires me. And now I have to say that she's now a volunteer of Red Cross. And then also my grandma. <laughs> my grandma also became volunteer of Red Cross, yes. You have the strong woman in the family. Exactly. Yes, yes. yes totally. Yes, very nice. Okay, so uh, what is important uh, for you being a leader? What leadership principles you, you try to follow every day? Wow. Being a leader for me is about inspiration. Being a leader for me is touching the hearts of many people, trying to tell them, I mean, we can do it together. You can do it. You have the power to do it. You have the power to change the world. You don't have to just sit and wait somebody to do it. You have the power. I mean, we have the power. And we put together all the powers, like in cartoons. We can change the world and we can do many things. So for me, leadership is, is that. It's a, a, a honor. It's a privilege. It's a, a responsibility. It's, it's, I mean, it's the opportunity to make the difference, I, I would say. Thank you. And uh, uh, in addition to your uh, president uh, duties as a Costa Rica, I know that you are now elected as a president of the Inter-American Committee. <laughs> so, so even more kind of responsibilities. Uh, but in this position, what do you see as the main uh, priorities or, or, or focus areas that you as a leader would like to, to address while being a president? Okay, I would start answering in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. And then we can jump for America's region. Um, in Costa Rica, with our team, we already make a, a process of analysis and we choose three priorities. We did it last year and this year we take the decision to continue working with that because it's still been priority in our national society and probably it's going to be for, for the next year and, and more. First priority we identify is to work with the people. We always say that, um, well, in Costa Rica, the first um, humanitarian uh, task we have is, is pre-hospital care services mm -hmm. because we have ambulances all over the country. We have like 700 ambulances and we are the first responder in um, pre-hospital care services. So if anyone calls 911, Red Cross is going to be there free of charge, totally free of charge. So we always use the example that we can have the best ambulance we can have the best equipment, we can have the best uh, RCP equipment, but if we don't have people, we don't have nothing. Mm -hmm. So you can have the best building, you can have the best technology, you can have whatever you want, the highest budget, but if you don't have people, again, you don't have nothing. So our first priority is persons mm -hmm. or people, and uh, we are trying to support our people, volunteers and staff. In Costa Rican Red Cross, we have 6,000 of volunteers, more or less, sorry, 5,000 of volunteers and 1,000 of staff. So it's like totally 6,000 of people in our national society and we're trying to support them in many areas, but um, persons or, or people then is the first priority. Then the second priority we have, we call it comités in Spanish. Comités means branches, mm -hmm. or filiales is another word that, that is used com commonly used in, in, in Spanish. Our branches is our second priority because we strongly believe that it's the base of, of the organization. I mean, headquarters work for the branches. Regional levels work for the branches because the branches are the ones that are in the community are in the community that in the case of Costa Rica, that we are a small country, really small country, we have 134 branches around the country. So if you have a picture of the map of Costa Rica, you will see many small red crosses everywhere. I have seen it. It's, impressive. <laughs> it's, yes. it's, it's really it's impressive and inspiring. So for us, the second priority is the branches and to make them stronger and to help them to deliver the humanitarian um, actions that community needs. And of course, taking in consideration that it's not the same a branch in the volcano, a branch in a mountain or a branch in the beach or a branch in the city. Each one has different needs, different challenges, different um, things to, to, to do for the community. 
So we decided to, to do like that. Then the third priority is about the community services. And talking about community services, as I said already, um, pre-hospital care services, for example, ambulance is one of our, our community services, but it's not the only one. If you ask a, a lady in the street about Red Cross, they will say ambulance. If you ask a, to, to a kid in the school, they will say ambulance. But we are more than ambulance. We have also climate change, climate change actions. We have youth programs. We have elderly programs. We have lady volunteers in our, in our national society. We work with community resilience. We work with disaster risk management. We work with disaster response, with search and rescue actions. So every uh, community service that our national society provide is our third priority. So I would say persons, mm -hmm. branches, and community service are our priorities in the national society. And in the Americas? In the Americas? Well, I just got elected last week or the yes, week before. Recently. And uh, with the team, we are trying to, to establish our own priorities as a team because I strongly believe it's not my priorities, it's the priorities of the team. But um, we have been like informally talking and we strongly believe that um, there is not um, enough information about what can we do together, and what, who we are, and what is the CORI. CORI is the name of this governing board in the Americas region. Mm -hmm. So our first action, because I, I don't want to say first priority, first action is going to be about communication. Communication um, in terms of people understand what means CORI, what is CORI, what is inside of CORI. And then what can, can we do for the others? In my personal view, first thing I would strongly work to, to make it possible is to work together. To work together because as we were talking in the, in the session, um, in the past session, we are a network and we are the biggest network, the stronger network, but we have to work together to make it possible. So um, for sure, one thing I would really, really strong to try to, to, to make it possible is to work together as national society, considering also as that the fundamental principles, universality talks about all sister national societies supporting each other. So does that also apply to our global network? If we look at the global network, what do you think are the changes that are needed for us to be better? We need to start focusing in what is important in the movement because we always are not fighting. We always are, are thinking in, in, in things that is not like really important for, for people. There are a lot of people dying in the borders because migration process. There are a lot of people dying in the, in the Mediterranean Sea because again migration. There are a lot of people dying because climate change, floods or, or droughts. Um, they're really important things we have to discuss and to figure out as a movement how to how to support, how to help, how to deliver these humanitarian services we, we provide. And at some point we just um, concent concentrate our energy in uh, about power, about positions, about uh, recognition, about mm -hmm. things that is, is not important. So I, I strongly believe that we need to focus all our energy in, in humanitarian, it's our mission. I mean, we don't have to forget our mission, our humanitarian mission. And I think that globally and regionally and probably nationally levels, we are not doing that. Yeah, okay. And um, another thing I'm curious about, because, you know, we hear this, uh, the world is changing around us very fast. There is this dynamic environment uh, mm -hmm. that is really, these changes happen uh, very fast uh, and we are not able to react to that. How do you experience that? Do you experience that the world is changing around us fast? And what are your strategies to, to, to deal with that, to be up, up to date and, and maybe even ahead? Yes, I think uh, all of us, these generations can truly tell to the next generation what happened with COVID, just to give an example. Because after COVID and many things that we already learned, we changed as a world and the world changed too fast. Too fast talking about social distance, too fast talking about um, remote work, talking about virtually education. So we face it. I mean, all of us face it because it just happened last year. Or the day. I mean, it's, it's just 
happened before. And this is just one example, because many reasons the world can change and the context of, of our national society also change can change because a uh, new uh, government in the in the in the country can change because new hazard came and and change uh, literally change things so we have to be ready for change but then we have to recognize that the change could be an opportunity so we ha we don't have to be afraid of changes if we are ready we can we can take the opportunity of changes as COVID again, because COVID of course we can start talking about all the the losses uh, the, the the person made all the deaths that we have all, all the negative things. But if we go back again into COVID, we can turn it into positive. And as national society, we learn a lot mm -hmm. during COVID process. We learn a lot, and I heard that there were many national society that take the COVID as an opportunity to grow. Take the COVID as an opportunity to be visible and to be recognized by, by the other actors. So, of course, yes, the world is changing. And I think we as a movement has to be ready to adapt and to keep moving forward. Uh, one of the things, you know, I heard actually leaders reflecting about COVID was, and I really hope this change will hold, hold, hold on, was that Suddenly you understand, but the people are working in in their homes, and you know, and suddenly you cannot control them, <laughs> you know. So somehow, this COVID was also ta taught many leaders was that no, but you just have to trust the people because, you know, you have to trust mm -hmm. that they're doing the best. And I think also COVID shows that people are doing not even the best; they're doing more than their mm -hmm. best. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also a very nice lesson uh, for this changing environment. Yes. yes, trust is is really important in our humanitarian field. Or to be honest, it's important in all the, all the fields. But exactly in our movement, trust is important. And in a leader position, you need to trust. And you need to build a network of, of people around you to support, to, to, trust, or to trust you and where you trust also in both sizes. And I think that will be crucial to, to finally make it happen. Okay, and uh, I have two, two, two final questions. So my, my one question is linked to how you as a leader nurture the young leaders who are in their national society because uh, that, that's, I think, fundamental for the success of our organizations that there are these young people already who today are engaged to, with, 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 the, with the way you think about strategy, decision-making, and yeah. so on. So what are your ways of, of engaging uh, young people, young leaders? That's a beautiful question and that makes me laugh, but from, from inside, from my soul, because <clears throat> the most beautiful, most beautiful thing that happened to me being president is to, to travel outside outside in my country, I mean, outside from the capital, in the regions and in the branches. And there was a, a young girl that when she see me, she immediately run and hug me. And she told me, I want to be the president also. <laughs> so can you imagine how beautiful it could be to inspire a, a baby girl? I was almost crying. I mean, and I told her, yes, really. You can be the president, but you have to be ready to be the president because it's not being there. You have to be ready to be. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly today in this summit and uh, a few hours before, a young girl from an northern national society, she told me, I have seen you in social media. It was like a shame. <laughs> and she told me, you inspire me. And you inspire me. And, and I think... I, I can do many things. There are many things I can go, I can do. I can support in my national society. I mean, that's that's enough for me. That's enough for me, because as I told you before, touching hearts is like like the mission of a leader, like inspiring others to to make it possible. If we all start making our own uh, task, our own uh, things, I mean, we can really change the world. We don't have to just again sit and wait somebody to do it. And I think as a young people, we have like the energy to keep doing, to keep moving, to keep inspiring. But then there's something really important that I would like to, to remark. And is that there is no empty chairs. This is not my phrase. It's a phrase of a colleague of mine in my governing board, but, but she's right always. There is no empty chairs. If there is a chair, somebody is going to sit there. So if you want to, to, to be, let's stand up and move and, and find the chair and sit in that chair mm -hmm. 
and, and trust yourself and believe yourself because you can do it. You can change it. I mean, you just have to, to need to, to have the tools you need and you need to have the trust in yourself and to jump and, and do it. But then I always say, don't do it if you are not ready. Don't do it if you are not sure that you can do it. Because if not, it's going to be a myth. Yeah. So if you want to sit in that chair, go and do it. I support you. I inspire you. I, I help you. But do it when you are ready to do it. Not because having that uh, chair is, is, is enough. It's not that the reason. Okay, and so my final question is, uh, I want to tell the viewers also that I have spent uh, three days here with Diane in, in the Innovation Summit in, in Nairobi, and we really had situations, you know, the, the, we had to wake up early, the car didn't come, there was a jet lag, and many situations, and I have never seen Diane angry or, or nervous <laughs> or anxious, you know, so really, how is it possible? Tell me, what is your, do you have some meditation practice? I don't know, what do you do to, to, never, to never lose it and to always have this good spirit i have to be honest i have to confess that's my my way of being that's diane always i mean even when i have a problem i like i feel like okay we have a problem <laughs> let's make it let's solve it let's find a solution and even when i'm really angry because it happened to me in my position in my national society i try i try to breathe i try to to sit down, to calm down, to understand, have the whole picture. And sometimes we need to use a microscope to see, but then sometimes you need to use a telescope, you know, to, to change the vision, the perspective, and to understand what's going on. My secret is to sleep well, <laughs> to be honest. I have like that uh, a skill to sleeping well, because when I go to bed and I sleep, I disconnect, mm -hmm. and then I open my eyes again and... Okay, let, that's me. Let's do it. Yeah. Even when I'm sick, even when I'm tired, when I'm angry, when I'm sad, when whatever, sleeping makes me change everything. So I never have like the telephone in the bed. I never have like that TV. I just sleep and that's it and it changed my life. But I think it's a bit, again something about um, attitude, you know. You have um, attitude and attitude and, and, and you, have to, you have to smile for the life. I mean, you cannot change everything. You can change how do you feel with the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And it's up to you if you get angry because somebody says something. It's up to you if you get angry because something didn't happen because the car, the jet lag, whatever. We have to enjoy. We just have one life and we have to enjoy our life and we have to enjoy our position. I have a colleague, Michael, which is also in the governing board and he's here with us. Michael teach me like the greatest um, lesson of my life. And he says, uh, if the position hurts you, you have to leave. I mean, you have to, to know yourself and you have to see when to stop. If you enjoy it, keep going as you want to go. But if you're suffering with that hat, with that position, stop and go away for a different place. You don't have to be there if you don't want to be there, if you mm -hmm. don't feel it, if you don't want to be... Uh, in, in that uh, area, in that uh, mission, in that position, in that thing, go away because you just have one life. You have to take decisions and you have to take decisions in your own life and, of course, in the national society or in the different levels we, we are. I think that's, that's important because it's the um, coherence between what you think and what you do and you have to feel okay. And then, talking again, just to, 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 to finish... You have to go to sleep, um, calm down. What I want to say with this, the decisions you make, you have to be sure that at night when you go to bed, you it doesn't sleep. disturb you. Yeah. I mean, you have to do whatever you can do with all your heart, with all your effort, with all your energy, do it. Be sure that when you go at night, the, I don't know how you say that in English, the pillow, won't talk to you like, come on, <laughs> what have you done? It never happens to me okay. because day by day in my personal life, in my national society life, in my work life, in my other areas, I always try to do what I feel is correct, mm -hmm. what I feel okay because my worst enemy could be Diane talking with the pillow, making me <laughs> worry. <laughs> so I really, really recommend like let's do what we feel we have to do 
and you have to feel comfortable with the decision you take. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> thank you, Jintar. And thank you, of course, all the network. Thank you, of course, Kenya Red Cross to support yes. us in this process. It has been beautiful, a beautiful journey, a beautiful study tour, learning from each other, these peer-to-peer -peer experiences. So, well, I wait you in Costa Rica. Yes, thank you. I hope <laughs> thank to come you. one day. Thank you.